My name is Brenda Corona on behalf of the stakeholder affairs at the California. So we welcome you to this meeting in which we will be discussing the issue paper and straw proposal that was posted a few weeks ago, along with a few of the upcoming deadlines for this particular paper on the August 8th of by the end of August 8th on the, this week. We will be also going to a few meeting reminders as this call is being recorded for informational and community purposes only. Any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. If you do experience any technical issues while submitting any questions on queue, feel free to send us a message to all panelists, or you could also send it to our event producer, Yolan, who will be monitoring any questions. But I will also be here to help assist with this meeting. For those who would like to ask a question on the WebEx queue, please use the raise hand icon that's located on the bottom of your screen above the participant window. This will allow you to be on the, on the hand, raise hand queue. As a reminder, if you do raise your hand and ask a question, make sure you lower it after your question. And also before stating your question, please state your full name affiliation so we can know who's asking the question. So those who are just stalled in the audio, just press star nine, star three to be added to the queue and Yolan will be able to monitor those out for us today. Um, the next is that we have an agenda um, for about going over for the overview of feedback and ongoing work with Sergio for about 20 minutes and then he'll go over the track one issues, Q and A, and then he'll go for proposed solutions for track one and then have a session for Q and A. And then at 2.50, we'll have an issues for track two and then Q&A. And then at the very end, um, Sergio and the team who are here panelists will be having an open stakeholder discussion. So we definitely invite you to hold on questions at Sergio's um, Q&A session. So that way we can fully address them and also monitoring those chat questions as well because they do come in pretty, um, Often, so we want to make sure we're addressing everything at a timely matter during this recording of this call. And I just want to give a thank you to Sergio, who's here today. He's our, our sector storage manager, as well as Becky Robinson, who is our director, and Amelia, who's also here today, helping support the CAISO staff. So we welcome them here as the panelist group who will be helping in case questions to come up to the panelists. As well, we'll be sending out a link on the chat where you'll be able to see the initiative webpage. As well, we are currently on the policy initiative stakeholder process on the very kind of beginning of part, so the straw proposal. So you'll see that we just posted a issue paper straw proposal a few weeks ago, and that just shows you here on our timeline how we're moving towards the next few steps. And we'll be addressing that at the next steps, um, the exact deadlines and also the posting of the other proposals and comment deadlines and meetings. So, We'll hold on tight for those next steps later on. And at this, at this time, I'll let Yolan go ahead and provide presentation access for Sergio, and he will take the floor. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Thank you, Rana. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this um, stakeholder meeting. As you can see, we'll basically use the time today to go over the um, the issue paper and straw proposal. Before we do that, I did want to provide a quick, you know, overview update on the uh, feedback that we received and how we have uh, incorporated it to <clears throat> this presentation and to the upcoming uh, deadlines and work that we're looking at. So, uh, first off, I wanted to share some of the feedback that we've seen to date, uh, particularly since we last met at uh, the, the second workshop for this topic. Um, since then, we've had a meeting with the <clears throat> Market Surveillance Committee, and that, that meeting also spurred uh, some, some discussion, some conversation with the stakeholder community, and also some conversations uh, internally for us as well. So I wanted to uh, you know, provide some of that uh, context of what we've, uh, our listening stakeholders are uh, you know, asking or, or suggesting and underscore how it's being you know, 
fed into our processes and, and how we're thinking about it moving forward. So as you are all aware, um, stakeholders have asked the ISO to, to provide clarity on the problem statement and they've requested numerical examples around the issues that we're tackling, uh, specifically around the issue of unwarranted storage VCR, which is the topic of track one of this initiative. Um, in the same, in the same uh, topic, stakeholders have underscored that uh, they believe that the current timeline might be insufficient to develop a holistic revision to VCR provisions, uh, particularly highlighting that these topics are complex and that a more you know, uh, in-depth conversation of these matters might be warranted. Um, in it also referring to track one, uh, Stakeholders have noted that there are some instances in which uh, VCR uh, might merit, you know, there, that, there are some instances that might merit specific VCR provisions. Here I've noted the instance in which resources are mitigated in intervals prior to a buy or sell back, uh, since this has been probably the, the circumstance that has been discussed the most, uh, in particular in that last market surveillance committee uh, call. And finally, um, stakeholders have also asked the ISO to provide additional clarity on the drivers and factors behind the buy and sell backs, uh, specifically asking for some form of descriptive statistics on the prevalence of the issue and what is driving those issues as well. So, um, given this feedback, you know, there, there is ongoing work that I wanted to share with the stakeholders here um, and some, you know, direct uh, uh, work that has to do with the feedback we've received. So first, uh, regarding the numerical examples, uh, we, we have included a number of examples, both in the workshop materials from the last meeting and in the issue paper and straw proposal. I wanted to highlight that there was one example in the materials included for uh, July 22nd that was not included in the issue paper and straw proposal. For those of you eagle-eyed readers, you might have noticed this. Uh, this is because the specific issue regarding upward movement capability to deliver reg up uh, that was underscored in that uh, example uh, has been resolved. So because of that, we excluded that uh, example from the issue paper and store proposal. I want to be very clear um, for those that recall this example. In this example, uh, the scheduling coordinator submitted updated uh, minimum and maximum um, um, outputs for these resources, and that made it so that it was unable, so that the resource was unable to, to have the necessary headroom, the necessary upward movement capability to deliver right up. So that issue, that latter part of the issue, having necessary upward movement capability to deliver right up, that has been resolved. Um, that does not mean, however, that including those biddable parameters or updating them in a manner that unduly affects the availability of the assets could not trigger uh, the, it doesn't mean that that could not trigger a buy or sell back. So the reason we eliminated that from the issue paper and store proposal is because of how it uh, affects directly the need for upward movement capability. Um, but we may include an, another example that, that, that doesn't have to do with uh, headroom for reg up that he, that describes how this updated uh, updating biddable parameters as this could have an effect on buy and sell backs. Um, we also heard during conversations uh, during the market surveillance committee call and, and afterwards uh, some stakeholders asking for added clarity on the calculation of uh, surpluses and shortfalls for determining BCR amounts. Uh, in this presentation, we have included an example that shows how that, that netting works. 
and that shows like how the calculation you know, generally is performed. Uh, the goal here being obviously uh, providing more clarity to stakeholders, but also to highlight the role of uh, the two components of that calculation, the day ahead real time imbalance and the impact of bidding with regards to the LMP and, and how that impacts overall bid cost recovery calculations. So we've, we've heard that need for added clarity and we're adding it here in these materials and we will also include that uh, as part of our next revision of the paper, given what we've heard. And finally, uh, we know that we've shared, you know, examples of, of the concern of the issue at hand, uh, but we are also developing examples using those, uh, those same um, scenarios that we've shared with you of how the proposed solution would minimize unwarranted VCR under these scenarios. So we will also be working, we are also working uh, to update these examples basically to show how our proposed solution would, would deal with them. Um, and that will be uh, included as part of the next uh, revision of our paper as well, and in future stakeholder meetings. Um, regarding the schedule, uh, we you know have heard that uh, some some stakeholders uh, are really underscoring the need for a bit more time to discuss these issues. Uh, we understand the complex nature of the issue at hand, uh, but we also want to uh, make sure that the sensitive nature of the issue is is also top of mind. And so far, we continue to believe that the expedited schedule for track one of this initiative is necessary, uh, particularly given the potential for the material adverse financial consequences for the market so that could result from any delay. At the same time, we encourage uh, stakeholders that would want to see uh, a different schedule to offer uh, their, their proposed uh, ideas in their written comments and we will consider them. We will, you know, look at that and and think about how uh, that could uh, work out. So, if you have, um, if you believe that a longer schedule, that more time would be helpful, uh, please let us know through your comments how you would ambition uh, that to to work out. Uh, I know that in different conversations, folks have said. Uh, three months, so others have said six months. So being able to understand that through your written comments would be of great help for us to uh, to consider any modification to, to the schedule as of now. Um, and uh, regarding uh, a, the topics or the scenarios that may warrant uh, you know, specific VCR considerations of pro or provisions. We also encourage stakeholders to provide examples of said situations uh, through their written comments. As of now, I believe uh, that, you know, the scenario that has been discussed the most uh, and that, you know, we've had uh, significant back and forth across the last two meetings, including the MSC meeting, has been mitigation. When uh, our resource is mitigated and because of said mitigation, it is uh, dispatched um, prior to its day ahead schedule and that triggers eventually a, a buy or sell back. Um, we are working on developing, uh, producing data uh, to, to better understand the frequency and magnitude of this potential issue. Uh, and you know, understand if uh, it is uh, material and prevalent enough to to warrant specific VCR treatment or specific VCR provisions. Um, as we continue to do this work, and as we continue to you know work on the issue paper straw proposal and its future iterations, it would be really useful if uh, stakeholders can underscore can provide examples of other cases that they see uh, could be, uh, could merit this type of analysis. Um, 
since so far, uh, it, it would seem that mitigation is perhaps the one out there that, that we might need to, to look out for. So if you have other thoughts, if you think there's other situations or conditions that may warrant this uh, additional kind of screening and understanding, uh, please let us know through your written comments. And finally, um, a number of stakeholders have also asked us to uh, produce some form of um, descriptive statistics that highlight what are the drivers or factors behind buy and sell backs, meaning why did it materialize? Uh, was it a, a result of a given bidding strategy? Was it a result of biddable parameters that uh, limit the availability of the asset or of mitigation, for example? Um, I want to you know, encourage stakeholders to take a look at the materials that DMM have provided previously in this initiative, as well as their <clears throat> recently released uh, battery storage reports uh, for a bit more, uh, you know, of an understanding of these factors. Um, at the same time, I want to, you know, uh, remind folks that these are indeed complex dynamics of our market. Uh, this may not be a, a buyback or a sellback, may be the result of more than one driver or factor. So it would be, uh, you know, it, it, it's potentially complex to uh, be able to attribute a given buy or sellback to a single factor and do that across the board to produce this type of um, descriptive statistics. But in the end, uh, as you know, was underscored during that MSC meeting, uh, regardless of the factor or driver behind a given buy or sellback, regardless of whether it was due to bidding strategies or biddable parameters or any other driver, um, our concern is that the current application of real-time BCR for storage resources uh, generally results in inefficiencies. It results in inefficient participation and it creates incentives to pursue outsized real-time BCR payments. Um, so while we you know, want to better understand some of these drivers to the degree that uh, they might merit uh, a different or special kind of consideration, uh, overall, regardless of the driver, the the way that this is uh, operating today um, results in concerns for from the ISO's perspective that need to be addressed uh, expeditiously. So, um, if you have you know thoughts on this matter as well, please do let us know through your comments. We'll continue to to work on on all this feedback. Uh, to better incorporate it to in our upcoming meetings, in our upcoming materials, including the, the future revisions of the papers. Um, and your perspective and your uh, examples, feedback, comments are always welcome and always very helpful to, to keep going. So um, I see I'm right at the 120 for this section, so I'll keep going um, to talk a little bit about the issue at hand in track one. This next section is, will be very familiar to all of you that have been following this initiative. Um, really what we want to, uh, what I want to include in the next section that is more novel and deep a little bit, uh, and dive a little bit deeper on is that example on how surpluses and shortfalls are calculated and netted across uh, the, a given period since uh, several stakeholders asked for a bit more clarity there. So um, let's talk about the issue at hand within track one, which as you all are familiar, it has to do with unwarranted uh, storage VCR. Uh, we don't really need to dwell in this initial slides. Uh, you, you are well aware that you know, we've uh, seen um, a misalignment between BCR uh, provisions related to storage and the overall objectives of the BCR construct previously. 
particularly with regards to the ASSOC constraint filing. Since then, uh, as storage penetration has grown dramatically within the ISO's footprint, uh, we've noted that you know, there are additional concerns that have to do with how BCR provisions apply to storage, uh, an issue that has been raised and, and underscored by DMM and the MSC in prior venues. Um, as I noted in our prior meetings, uh, BCR, because recovery is a settlement process through which eligible resources can recover their bid costs. Their bid costs are enlisted here in the first bullet. Um, for the purposes of determining BCR eligibility, uh, we use a concept called the commitment period, uh, which is looking at the consecutive time periods in a given trading day where a resource is online and synced to the grid and available, um, but before the, the period where there are you know, awards or, or schedules. Uh, to calculate VCR, we look at those commitment costs and at the energy and AS bid costs, and we use them as an input um, to see the net difference between costs and revenues for uh, different there are different calculations for each, uh, for, for a couple markets. First, we do it for the IFM, then we also do it for ROC and real time. So there's two ongoing uh, processes where this is done. So um, this is also included in the paper, and this is why we wanted to provide more clarity on, on an approximation of how this is calculated. Uh, when we look at that difference between total cost and revenues, we would find that the difference is either positive or, or negative, right? Um, when the difference is positive, that results or that represents in a, sh uh, a shortfall. When the difference is negative, it represents a surplus. So this language is taken directly from uh, the VPMs and uh, I want to underscore two things here. Uh, the first one is that this sign convention is the one used in the VPNs, the one used, you know, through the settlement process. Um, if market participants were to look at their, uh, you know, outcomes, they would see this this convention, and that's why we want to keep that here in this explanation. If you were to look at our graphical examples uh, from the the other meetings, the prior meetings we've had in this initiative, those graphical examples are not using this sign convention, right? So uh, a shortfall is seen in the graphs that we shared as negative. Uh, we decided to do that because it was more easily understandable in a graphic uh, context. Um, but here I want to be clear that the convention for the VPM and for the uh, oh, the settlement process is negative means surplus, positive means shortfall. So shortfalls and surpluses are netted for all the hours of a trading day and for ROC and uh, RTM, they're netted for all the intervals in that, in that trading day. At the end of the, of the trading day, like once we've netted everything, if the total net amount is positive, then that represents a shortfall, and the resource receives a VCR uplift payment equal to that net amount. Um, so that is you know, important to, to underscore. Now, um, as you can see you know, from this description, uh, VCR is really designed to provide uplift payments to resources when the revenues from selling energy and AS don't cover all of their costs over the course of a day. Um, this has been, as we've discussed before, designed with conventional thermal assets in mind, assets where a concept of commitment makes sense, as thermal power plants may incur in certain costs, such as fuel and startup costs, to reach their desired output level prior to a given award or schedule. Um, now, this uh, application of BCR is not 
uh, necessarily uh, reasonable for for storage resources where the concept of commitment uh, is not applicable really. Uh, storage resources, they do not have startup or uh, startup costs, and nor do they have minimum load requirements. So for storage, as we'll talk in a couple of slides, things are a bit different. Um, but what I want to show now is this uh, simplified netting example that I think will help uh, some stakeholders have a better grasp of uh, what the issue at hand is. Um, and, you know, the goal here, just as the goal was with the graphical examples, is for this to give an idea of the uh, how the process works and how we, we see it work. Here we'll be focusing a little bit more on, on the numbers, whereas on the graphic example, we wanted to show it more visually, right? So uh, let's imagine a resource uh, that has a day ahead schedule to inject 10 megawatts during our ending 17. Uh, this resource, this is very, very simplified. This resource has that one hour to, uh, of, of energy, you know, to work with, and this is its only schedule. Um, in the real-time market, this resource actually injects 10 megawatts but during our ending 13. So it is, una uh, it is unable to inject power later on in our ending 17. So for this uh, example, and you know, in general, we are looking at this formula uh, uh, at a given interval, right? Uh, this formula is a product of differences, as you can see, and the first one represents the imbalance the, between real time and day ahead. And the second one uh, represents the, the difference between the bid and the LMP in real time. So as we mentioned before, the way to get to a shortfall, uh, a shortfall is represented with a positive sign. So the way to get with a shortfall is to either have, you know, ha have one of these be negative and the other one be positive of this uh, elements within the, the parentheses. So let's look at this example. In this example, let's assume that the real-time bid is $25 uh, throughout uh, the, the trading day. The real-time LMP in our ending 13 is $35. This is why the resource was in the money in our ending 13, why it was economically dispatched. And the real-time LMP at our ending 17 is $100, which was the hour when the resource was unable to perform later on. So for our ending 13, we, we would see something like this, uh, 10 megawatts minus zero, because 10 was the real-time dispatch, minus zero, which was the day-ahead schedule, that results in 10. Then $25 minus $35, which is the bid minus the LMP, that results in minus 10, which gives us a, a total of minus $100. Since it's minus, this is a surplus. Remember that sign convention. For our ending 17, we would see a shortfall. Uh, there was actually zero megawatts, megawatts dispatched, minus 10, that was the schedule. That gives us minus 10. Then $25 was the bid minus $100, which was the real-time LMP, gives us minus $75. Minus 75 times minus 10 gives us $750 positive, which is a shortfall, a shortfall of $750. So assuming that there were no other awards, no other schedules for simplicity, for the trading day, we would see a net shortfall of $650. Um, so obviously, you know, this shows uh, just by, by the example itself, uh, it can show that, you know, there, the, the, the resource can perceive some revenue from uh, VCR. And, you know, that is uh, kind of the goal of VCR if this resource had commitment, uh, startup, minimum load cost, et cetera. Um, but, also, this example shows how 
some of these variables, you know, are at the discretion of um, the asset itself. So let's look at the same example, but let's assume that the resource bids to maximize the shortfall. So here we're going to have the same bid at our ending 13, $25, the same LMP, um, our ending 13, $35, the same LMP at our ending 17, $100. But now the bid for our ending 17 is minus $150. And it is that bid because that is the bid that maximizes that maximizes the, the second term in that calculation for our ending 17. So you can see for our ending 13, we have the same outcome, a surplus of $100. But for our ending 17 now, we have a, a shortfall that is significantly larger because of how the second term that looks at real-time bids minus real-time LMP works. So now we have minus 150 minus 100, giving us minus 10 megawatt times minus $250, resulting in a shortfall for this period of $2,500. Again, assuming no awards, no other awards or schedules for simplicity, this would result in a net shortfall over the trading day of $2,400. So hopefully this um, numerical example that is even more uh, simplified than the graphical examples we've shown give you an idea of how the surplus and shortfall calculation works. Um, this in, in reality, you know, in, in, in the real time, this is calculated every five minutes and then netted for uh, all of the trading day. Uh, here, obviously, you know, we've made it even more simple so that you can see the effects and the drivers. And uh, just finally, to, to really drive this down, the sign conventions in this example are the opposite of those in our graphical examples, right? Um, we, we did that in the graphical ones because it was more uh, evident that, you know, if you're under zero, that's, that's shortfall. But, these are the sign conventions used in the BPM and in the settlement process. So given these issues, um, we, we are aware, as I said before, that the, the logic uh, underneath like supporting BCR um, of identifying potential bid costs that uh, it cannot, uh, that, that may warrant uplift for resources that experience uh, commitment uh, might not be applicable to storage since they do not have startup nor minimum load costs and they lack the conventional drivers for VCR, meaning commitment. Um, and also, we, we also know that contrary to uh, conventional resources, uh, storage resources, their bits are not just, you know, their marginal costs to produce at a given moment, at a given interval, but they also reflect uh, desire to be dispatched or not given their opportunity costs, meaning that the bids from storage resources are not equivalent to those submitted by thermal assets, uh, nor do they represent actual bid costs. Uh, they, they have other elements there that are not actual bid costs. So because of that, um, we believe that, you know, there is an important uh, you know, differenti differentiated treatment between storage and conventional generators. Uh, when a conventional thermal asset is unable to perform due to unavailability, like an outage, the expected energy from that asset is slick energy and is thus ineligible for VCR. In contrast, when the same happens from a storage resource, when it is unable to meet its day ahead schedule due to physical limitations, like not having enough state of charge to support that award or schedule, uh, the market instructs a dispatch to zero. This is categorized as optimal energy and is then eligible for BCR. Um, so this disconnect between conventional and storage resources 
uh, creates two concerns. First, that storage assets are not exposed to real-time prices for deviating from their schedules, uh, meaning that you know their the risk is set at the floor of their schedules. Uh, they're not exposed additionally to to, to real-time conditions. Uh, but also a second concern that storage assets may be incentivized to be inefficiently so as to maximize that VCR and market payment, um, which is the scenario uh, that we've described in that second simplified netting example, right? When the bids are done in a way that are seeking to maximize the shortfall at a given interval. Um, in this, given these concerns, um, what we found is that there are VCR payments that are ongoing today that are not aligned with the intent of VCR, uh, particularly those that are related to the to the buy and, and sell backs, as we've described previously. And here, you know, I've included that language uh, on what a buy and sell back is as well. Uh, I don't believe that it would be the, the best use of our time right now to go over the graphical examples that we've discussed previously, but uh, they are all included, both the simplified and the complex ones in these materials and in the issue paper and stroke proposal. So with that, uh, I think this is a, yeah, this is a good time to pause for any comments or questions. Um, and, you know, to the degree that stakeholders have comments or questions also on the feedback and ongoing work, uh, please feel free to, to express them here as well. I think I see one hand up. Sergio, this is Rahul from AES. Can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, thank you for providing these additional slides and more context and information about you know what Kai was thinking. Uh, I have a procedural question first. Uh, given that you know Kaiso has provided more clarification today uh, and some examples is the timeline for providing the feedback still august 8th uh, um so far it is uh if if you believe that it should be different uh, this would be a great time to to start that that discussion what are what are your thoughts Raul? so I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh Hello, feedback. Yeah, you know, we have gone through the examples and still combing through and trying to understand the implication of what is the impact to the market. Um, and we also need to strat strategize internally to come up with our collective position. So that's why I would request if we can get uh, at least a week time more of extension to provide feedback and i'll i hope you you take that into consideration uh and i maybe if i can move on to a little more substance uh, if i can uh quick quick question when you say a week you mean from today or from the 8th from the, like eight. the 12th or the 15th 15th would be better okay uh i will we will consider that and let you know as soon as possible yes okay uh, so, if I may go more into substance of the proposal, uh, I if I'm trying to go back to the slides and see where you have the proposal. I'm assuming the proposal hasn't changed from what was published in the straw yeah, proposal. That, that hasn't back. changed. That hasn't changed, and we'll go over those slides right after this. If if you want to talk about 
the, the, the proposal too, but yeah. Yeah, I think maybe just let me know when I can go more into detail. And I, I believe the example that you provided for bid cost recovery is extremely helpful. Uh, and I, I'm trying to see if I j should wait for my question. The, yeah, I think I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing some of the slides that may answer what I'm looking for, so I'll, I'll wait. Perfect. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll have an opportunity for questions after after each little section. Um, so I'll I'll remind you then. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I do not see any other hands at this point. I think we can we can keep going then and uh, we'll definitely, oh, Michael? Long, can you go ahead and unmute Michael Bolt and please be sure to introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi, this is Michael Volpe from PGD. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Michael. Great, thanks, Sergio. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question on the uh, the equation that you've presented, and you know, like, yeah, I think. Next. Oops, sorry, I overshot that. Yeah, this, this, yes. This, uh, I think it, maybe it's this one or the next one. Yeah, so this this will work. Um, you know, when the when the um, the bid price goes to negative one fifty, and then you know that that is kind of creating this large um, shortfall in, in your your next slide. But I, I was wondering, you know, what you what you thought if this was just a if the problem was netted to zero. So if if instead of like the the bid floor of minus one hundred and fifty, instead if you're taking the maximum of the uh, the bid and the and zero. Would would most of this issue go away in your mind, or do you still feel like there's an opportunity for strategic bidding? Um, I'm sorry. Could you could you restate your question? I I didn't really follow. Uh, my apologies. Yeah. No. No worries. I I think I'm still <laughs> to speak. But um, you know, here in this example, in the third bullet, where you're saying the the bid price. In real time goes to minus 150, and then it's creating it's ballooning the shortfall up to 2500. But if the you real -time kept, bid goes to minus 150, yeah, yeah. So, so if if instead you know that you were taking is it is it just a problem that it's going to the negative range, which is creating this this ballooning of the, the shortfall, or if you had if you were taking kind of zero as a floor instead, presumably mm. it would only raise your your shortfall to a thousand maximum of a thousand, right? Well, the taking it to zero would be less uh, impactful, but the dynamic still stands, right? Where I included here minus one hundred and fifty because that is the bit floor, right? So if you want to maximize if a given participant would want to maximize this second term, that is the difference between the bid and the LMP, um, this would be the way to go. Now you go to minus 150. Now uh, the another, if, if this was zero, uh, that makes it so that this given this particular example, the shortfall, the shortfall is smaller, 
but the incentives to do exactly that uh, would still stand, right? Let's imagine that in our ending 17, the LMP is not $100, but uh, $1,000, you no? Know? Uh, even if you can bid to zero, then uh, there, you still have a, an incentive to play with your bid so that the second term is the largest it can be and you maximize the shortfall. Here we're using minus 150 because that's the most uh, extreme position uh, that you could take in terms of a bid for these purposes. If it's zero, if it's one, whatever the minimum is, um, you would still be able to, to maximize that second factor. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. I'm, I'm just kind of asking if, if you think that it's just the nature of the equation is, which is causing the, this issue or, or if, you know, you're saying that, that even at zero dollars, you would still see these, these outsized PCR payments. Yeah, I would say that it's not really the nature of the equation itself. It's the incentive side with how we're applying these equations for energy that should not be deemed optimal. Um, basically, where I'm going is the the equation doesn't need to change itself, but we don't need to apply this equation in all circumstances, particularly for storage resources, when their energy uh, related to this net shortfalls or surpluses is is actually you know physically unavailable it's not just a matter of of uh, of imbalance yes we're including the formula because we've been asked by by stakeholders to have a little bit more clarity on the mechanics and how this actually works today uh, not to suggest that the formula itself must be revamped yeah, thank, thanks for that. And I, and I think, you know, it would be helpful if, um, as you go through, or maybe we can put this in comments, but the tying the, the equation you have is, as far as the, you know, real-time dispatch minus day head schedule times real-time bid minus real-time OMP. If you could tie that to, the, to what's in the, the BPM, um, because I, I, I looked it over and I, I don't see it worded that way or, or in the or know that way, but if, if you could kind of close the, the loop on that, it would be appreciated. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Thank you, Michael. Next, we have Callie Wells. Let's go ahead and unmute yourself. And those who are online, make sure to um, lower your hand in case you don't have any more questions. Yeah, hi, this is Callie Wells with WPTF. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I think I saw your head shake um, as in yes. So apologies if I missed this somewhere in either the DMM report or some of the analysis you guys have done, but have you broken out the BCR payments by uh, real-time bid? So I'm curious if we see a larger chunk of this real-time BCR when they do bid, you know, negative, um, like the previous caller had asked about, versus maybe when they bid closer to the day head price or some other level. Because one of your guys' justifications for, I think, fast-tracking this was the potential financial impact. And I'm wondering if um, maybe, depending on how that data shakes out, you might consider a stock gap solution, an interim solution, or something else if, if the bulk of that BCR is in one of those categories so that we can then have a proper holistic review of BCR, um, which I think a lot of stakeholders have been asking for in this effort rather than fast tracking it so quickly. Um, so again, apologize if I missed it somewhere, but do you happen to know how that breaks out or maybe you can provide it in the next iteration of the paper? Yeah, I do not have that information at hand. Um, that is something that we can look into uh, better understanding. And, you know, I would also note um, 
to the degree that you or other stakeholders um, uh, want to suggest a uh, timeline that kind of better integrates with what you're thinking as a, a, a holistic um, review of BCR, we'll, we'll be happy to, to look at that through your comments too. So, so let us know, but we can take this piece of feedback and see how we can uh, incorporate it in, prior, in, in future iterations of the paper. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I know, you know, we've put in our prior comments that we really would like the CAISO to take the appropriate time to vet a holistic review of BCR, because I think that's what the commitment was to FERC. Um, now, obviously, if there's, you know, uh, other concerns like certain bidding parameters or, or strategic bidding, um, that aside, the holistic review, I guess, I'm going to, I don't want to speak for others, but kind of the reason we haven't put in a specified timeline for that is because, you know, in past when we have a certain timeline on a policy effort, we seem to try and make sure that we get through the policy effort at that time instead of, and a lot of times that cuts it short. Um, so you don't want to prematurely define a deadline for a holistic review of any policy effort because that always ends up, um, you know, with some concessions being made just because of the timeline we've set ourselves on. Um, so just, again, not speaking for others, but that's kind of one of the reasons why we haven't said, you know, give us three months, give us six, is because I think we need to let the conversation happen naturally um, when you're doing a holistic review of the policy process. So, but yeah, but if you guys can provide that data in the next iteration, the breakout, that would be really useful. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I don't think I see any other hands. Well, Rahul, hands, uh, his hand is up, but I think it was for the next section, so maybe we can keep going. Um, but thank you all. Okay. Let me catch up to where we were. Okay, so now we'll talk a bit about the proposed solution for track one issues, uh, which as, as we all indicated before, uh, this really hasn't changed for, uh, this really hasn't changed from the prior uh, couple meetings where we've discussed this. Um, we are, uh, the ISO is proposing to refine the VCR provisions for storage resources so that if a storage resource is unable to meet its day ahead schedule due to physical limitations, like having an SOC that cannot support that schedule, um, uh, today what we do is that the market is instructing that asset to, to zero megawatt dispatch uh, because the SOC is binding. So that today, that results in the energy being categorized as optimal energy, which is eligible for DCR. Our proposal is to redefine that dispatch that is unavailable due to state of charge constraints in the binding interval as non-optimal energy, meaning that it would not be eligible for VCR. So a couple of key things to underscore in this second bullet. Uh, the first one is that the dispatch is unavailable due to state of charge constraints, meaning we're looking at whether the asset is uh, full or empty, and that's why it cannot support an award or schedule. Uh, the second part is really that binding interval. We are just looking at the binding interval uh, in in the real time, so at that, those five minutes, um, meaning that this would not fully eliminate VCR. There will be intervals where um, there is sufficient state of charge to support uh, a fraction of an award or schedule, uh, or there is, you know, a partial uh, uh, support for that award or schedule. Uh, in those intervals, there might be some VCR still. It is in the binding interval where dispatch it cannot be supported, right, when, when you are full or empty. Um, and it is not looking at, 
intervals beyond the binding interval in real time. So not looking at the advisory intervals. Um, we propose to look at this in, in the real time binding interval, resource by resource, right? So every single, for every, for every asset. Um, if a given resources, a state of charge at the start of that binding interval is equal to its minimum or maximum value, then that would uh, trigger a re-rate or derate of that P max or P min to zero. Um, this would be done in a post-market process when uh, expected energy and the expected energy allocation results are generated from the market results. And this uh, solution would work in conjunction with the ASSOC constraint, the end of our SOC constraint, upper and lower charge limits, the attenuated SOC constraint. By this, we mean it's in addition to all of those, right? Like well, this is, uh, we're adding uh, uh, this to, to these other constraints enlisted here. I know that that was um, an area where a couple of stakeholders requested clarification on what we meant uh, by that in the paper. Um, so this proposed solution would thus lead to reclassifying any of the energy associated with buy or sell back in that binding interval as non-optimal due to physical limitations that make it not available for dispatch, therefore excluding it from the BCR calculation. Uh, now the BCR calculation, you know, it will continue happening on the other on the other intervals like as, as needed, but if this is triggered in the binding interval, the energy associated to that limitation is excluded. So we believe that this will materially limit the chances of unwarranted BCR uh, derived from buy or sell backs of the day ahead schedule. Uh, the proposed solution would also align with the treatment of other dispatchable resources, namely conventional thermal assets, where their expected energy is categorized as slick energy when unavailable to perform, and it's also ineligible uh, for because recovery. Um, we think that this solution would eliminate uh, the, the lion's share of the VCR that we're seeing uh, related to buy and sell backs while still, you know, respecting the fact that there might be some BCR uh, in intervals where the state of charge can partially support uh, wards and schedules. So as a result, you know, this is not a full uh, elimination, but it does get to the vast majority of the issue at hand. And we think that it first, you know, uh, addresses the, the issue, the concern that storage resources are currently not exposed to real-time conditions given the applicability of current BCR rules. And second, it also alleviates that concern of um, resources having an incentive to bid in an inefficient manner so as to uh, maximize the combined revenue of BCR and market revenues. Um, this section, you know, of, of the proposed solution hasn't changed from the paper, hasn't changed from what uh, was discussed previously at the MSC and other meetings. Uh, so I'll pop here to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, I think we have Alva first. Hello, uh, Sergio. This is uh, really good. Appreciate your fleshing out. Uh, by the way, this is Alva Spoda from PG&E. Uh, really appreciate your fleshing out your track one proposal. Um, I just wanted to ask for a little bit more detail or m m your thoughts on, on more detail on this. Um, so the first thing that I see in, on, on page 25 was that the trigger in settlements is going to be that you, um, that there's uh, a calculation that the state of charge has hit a constraint at the beginning of a given interval. Um, and is that a market calculation 
or a telemetry calculation or both because normally the the state of charge at the beginning of the binding interval is something that comes from uh, telemetry and then not dispatch but uh, a, a um, an initialization that's not entirely transparent to market participants um, that calculates what the initial state of charge is going to be at the beginning of the interval. So um, is it that value that's calculated in the market process that's going to be used there? Or is it the actual um, beginning of interval tel telemeter state of charge? Which are you, which are you talking about there? That is a great question. Uh, let me see. I believe I have uh, some folks here that could help me address that. If you give me a quick moment. Right, thank you. Give me one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. So basically the question is, is it, is it the telemetry SOC or the estimated in market SOC, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's fundamental. If we want to put, put this in a parking lot, that's my first question is, and, and that's yeah, I think obviously important for the FMM because uh, that estimate is done a half hour in advance um, and there's some process that Kaiso is using. If you had regulation, there'd be some calculation being done based on the attenuation factors, other forecast type of information that might be driving that. So I just wanted to get the details on how that that calculation is being done. Um, I'm trying to move. By the way, I'm trying to move in, in my questions. Uh, I'm, I'm just assuming that this may happen, and I'm just trying to get uh, some clarity on the on, on the rules under which this is going to be done. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's, I think uh, I've got other questions that are, that are basically kind of similar to that, um, having to do with how the, um, forecast versus actual SOC are going to interact at the beginning of the interval and then during the interval, um, in particular in the, in the case of the FMM where you're actually covering three real-time dispatch intervals. Um, and also, um, and if you want to also put in the parking lot, if there's nobody on, on right now, uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the question of um, if a battery deviates from instruction in such a way as to um, uh, avoid hitting a state of charge limit, um, does that have any effect on this? I'm, if the if the entirety of the calculation is done based on the the market optimization, then it shouldn't have any effect on that on the binding interval. Of course, it could have effects on on future intervals, but it shouldn't have any effect on the binding interval. But I'm curious as to ensuring that that is, or or understanding whether that is the case in the binding interval. If if you were to, for example, just say, well, I'm I'm about to hit that limit. I don't want to. I don't want to have my BCR disallowed, so I'm going to, um, you know, deviate unilaterally. Uh, does that, um, is that a potential activity that a market participant could do in order to try to avoid triggering this loss of BCR? Yes, thank you for that question, Alva. So first off, regarding your first question, I've gotten a message from colleagues here noting that this would be looking at the real-time SOC that is you know, given from the telemetry. Uh, I will triple check that and include that clarification as well in our materials in any future version of slides or papers. Uh, but, and I will confirm that with you as well. Okay. And that, um, I, I will say that, second... that um, before, before you go on, I, I want to say that that doesn't make entire sense to me. I mean, it, it might make sense that you would say it's going to be the more constraining of the market value versus the, and the telemetry value, but to say that the um, the real time telemetry is going to determine this um, doesn't make sense because the dispatch instructions are going to be based on the market value. So um, 
maybe I'm not I'm not confident that that answer is com is complete. Um, but thank you. Yes, I can. I can confirm because I might be mistaken too. Uh, we've got a thorough, thorough chat going on right now. But right. Um, on the on the second question, that was also a concern of ours when thinking about this uh, uh, solution. Um, the uh, we don't think that this could be avoided. Um, well. First of all, when you say a unilateral deviation, you mean deviating from the, the dispatch or do you mean bidding in a way that you would not hit the constraint? That's an deviating important from the dispatch. differentiator. I, I, I'm, I'm okay. assuming that, yeah, I'm assuming Kaiso wants bidding in such a way as to try to avoid hitting the constraint. That's That's what I heard in previous discussions. Um, that you, you you want market participants to, through their bidding, attempt to avoid these kinds of situations. But I but I'm just gotcha. wondering about unilateral deviations within an interval, or you know, um, and the uh, the consequence of that. Yeah. So um, my understanding is that today, uh, resource if they were to deviate. From the dispatch, it would be disqualified from BCR uh, by the rules itself. Given that, like, if a if a resource is going to be, you know, acting uh, without following a zero dispatch in the case here of you're hitting a maximum or minimum, uh, your P max or P min that is now being derated and you're deviating from the zero megawatt dispatch, that would make it so that it's disqualified from BCR. So that's okay. not really an option to be able to preserve the BCR eligibility. Not, at least not in that interval, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help. It could help in, in if, if you were convinced that you knew how to second guess the CAISO for future intervals, you, you might be deviating in a, in a current interval in order to avoid some constraint being hit in a future interval, but but that would that, that's that's not relevant to the to the BCR and the binding interval. Correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have Don next. Don Treadway. Hi, Don Trethway from uh, California Energy Storage Alliance. Uh, I think you should really heed Elva's advice there. Uh, there's a lot of complexity and, un, you know, in terms of how this is actually going to be implemented and what those interactions are uh, that we need a lot more detail on. Um, so, but I, but my main, my main point was, you know, what we, the point we were making at the MSC meeting and the MSC meeting uh, members made as well is there's, there's instances where Yes, if it's the if it's the SC of the storage resources that's causing the SOC that you don't want it to get bid cost recovery. But we know that there are market design issues that can result in the SOC being mismanaged. The most dominant one that highlighted by the MSC was the current real time bid uh, default energy bid calculations. But there's other items such as the uh, 75 minutes prior to the operating hour. Uh, bid submission issue that can cause that as well. And so I think recognizing that that's the case, basically saying that you're going to try and solve now both the two the two instances that you're concerned of. The first is the ability to inflate your BCR payments so that you can get additional revenues versus um, not being not being not storage resources not being exposed to the real time bid price when they can't meet their SOC and that's inappropriate. And that's why on the MSC call, I think you can separate those two issues and you can address the uh, bidding concerns that you have in a very simple BCR settlement versus trying to do all of this other complex stuff, which would then give us time to think about what the appropriate approach would be. For instance, with regards to the bid cost recovery for uh, 
uh, when when resources are mitigated, you know, the MSC talked about using the same thing, same approach as it's done with exceptional dispatch. That's going to take more time than bringing something to September. Um, so if, if you could actually go to page 18 of your presentation, I think we can we can walk through how you can actually address your concern that allowing someone to bid negative 150 allows them to inflate their BCR above and beyond what they what they would do. And, and what you need to do to this example is put the day ahead price on there. So if if you assume an hour ending 17 that the day ahead price is $100, okay? Yes, by allowing the resource to bid at negative 150 and basically paying them $250 that they have actually inflated, the, the, and they, have, they make, and by, when I say they, intentionally or unintentionally, as some people pointed out before, the RA, the flexible RA rules require you to bid and bidding negative 50, 150 is completely consistent with that. With that. Um, so, but if your day has, get, you basically change the rule to not use the 150, but rather to use the IFM price, I think you can go, you can actually address your concern that people's strategic bidding can inflate BCR payments above and beyond what's necessary. So uh, let me just walk through it. If, if you had a rule that said the real-time bid cost in BCR was the higher of the IFM price or the resources real-time bid, okay? So let's look at our ending 17. Let's assume that the IFM price was $100. In this, if you use the rule that I had, you would basically replace negative 150 with $100 and you would have no BCR shortfall for our ending 17. Agreed? Yeah, I, I agree with that, Matt. So, so now, now let's now let's assume that the the uh, day ahead price was ninety dollars. Okay, if it was ninety dollars. There would be a hundred dollar um, uh, shortfall, which in our ending seventeen, which would be offset by the uh, uh, surplus in our ending thirteen. But the way to think about it is you. If you wanted to look at the day ahead price, because remember, that's what they, they were paid $100 and then they need to, to basically uh, be made whole so that they could, or excuse me, $90. Um, and so that would actually make them whole. And likewise, if the price was, if the day ahead price was 80, you're going to need to pay them another $10, the, the full 20 to get them whole to their, to their bid. And I, I think that's a simpler way, but it, the key problem with that is, the issue remaining is it doesn't expose them to the real time price when they deviate, but it addresses your issue that you're the big dollar issue you're concerned about here is that the real time bidding could inflate BCR above and beyond what's necessary to make you neutral to basically the fact that you need to buy back your day ahead schedule. And I think if you focused on that as a short term solution, then we can have more discussions in, and the nuances about how do we identify whether it was caused by the scheduling coordinator's actions or caused by a, a market design issue. But it's it, everything you said you need to be urgent, I think that addresses. Uh, thank you for the comment, Don. Um, I would say that we see both issues as urgent. We, just, we don't just see the bidding, we don't just see the second concern as urgent. We see both of them as urgent, and our proposed solution gets to both. I, I uh, think that's that's they, where I'm pushing back on. They do they have different urgency. That's the that's my point. Is the fact that someone can basically profit from a day ahead uh, or buyback of a day ahead schedule is a higher issue to me concern than the fact that they're not exposed to the real time price because the not exposed to the real time price. That's really, have you given, have you given scheduling coordinators of storage resources sufficient tools to actually reflect the real-time conditions and their bid prices? And the MSC even pointed out that that's not the case. So I think there is a different urgency between the two. Yeah, uh, I, I understand your perspective. I would add, you know, that we are in fact 
expanding the tool set for storage to, you know, be able to represent that within their bits, including the recently approved changes relative to 831. We understand that there's not, that there are other solutions or other tools out there that could also be applied and enhanced, but I, yeah. it is not. I would just push back, uh, Sergio, that that's what track two, you, that's, what you're, that's why you have track two. That's what track two is supposed to solve. If you, if you solve the issues you highlight in track two, then you could make the argument that you have removed the uh, limitations that the storage scheduling coordinators have to ensure that their real-time energy bids reflect real-time conditions. But you're not there yet. You haven't even started track two. You need to solve track two, I think, before you can go after uh, uh, the, 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 the first issue that you highlight that they're, ex or the second, that they're high, they're not exposed to real-time prices when the SOC, their SOC causes a deviation. What specifically in track two? The, the depth? The, uh, the real-time dev adjustment for all resources, okay. the ability for hybrid resources to bid above a thousand during high price conditions, the ability for them to create a default energy bid that also reflects real-time uh, uh, conditions yeah. in the default energy bid. Okay. Thank you for the, for the comment. Yeah. Don, can I jump in here um, just briefly? This is Becky Robinson with the ISO. Sorry, Sergio, to interrupt. Um, Don, thanks for the thanks for the suggestion, uh, and I see what you're I see what you're suggesting, and and I think I understand why. But I guess I I am curious. Do you do you agree that it's a problem that um, that under the solution that you've offered, storage resources would still sort of have this insulation from the real-time price and that, you know, and that we would want to get to a place where ultimately um, we do have storage resources who are much more mindful of and uh, of real-time conditions, real-time prices, and that, that ideally there would be more exposure to that. I guess, is it a difference in um, the problem that we should be trying to solve or is it just sort of a, that's, that's a longer, that's perhaps a longer conversation to get there? Oh, and sorry. Yeah, if we've muted, muted to that. Real time. Oh, I still on. There you go. We can we hear you hear now. But okay. We uh, we didn't hear anything that came before. So if you if you don't mind starting over, appreciate that. Okay. So, so I think the key is that yes, that's you want to address the issues where they're not exposed to the real time prices, but before you can do that, you need to make sure that you've given scheduling coordinators of storage resources the sufficient tools. To be able to do that and and we're not there yet and that's what requires more time um and discussion around this you know i think again the 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 issues with the real-time debt are are concerning i also think that you know the ability to update bids you know another this is another item the msc brought up you know there's a 135 minute window where there's no ability to reflect in changing bids based on the SOC. You know, this that that topic was something that was within the scope of the energy storage enhancements initiative that hasn't even started yet, that was supposed to start. So I think what I would that's why I said I think it's appropriate to separate the two because this the example where you have where it's at negative 150 and my example where the day ahead price was 100. That results in basically additional revenue simply because of the bid cost recovery rules relative to what the, the, the look at the day ahead and real time settlement together for that resource. Whereas, but on the other stuff, I just, you, you haven't gotten there yet and we need to spend, spend time getting there. And that's why what I, what I'm proposed, I think is what you should focus on for track one and for track, the track two stuff, you need to address all of that before you can have confidence that you've given scheduling coordinators the ability to actually reflect real time conditions in their bids. Thanks, Don. That's helpful. Uh, just to to clarify, I, I, you know, on the on the storage modeling enhancements, um, 
type of concept and ideas. Um, we we do still want to have that conversation. I don't think that was specifically. Um, I don't think we were necessarily thinking about including that in track two. Um, but I yeah. but I hear you saying that you know that's that's kind of part of the solution too. Um, I do think we want to you know follow up in terms of you know having those conversations in the near term. So I I don't want the presumption to be we're putting those off for a long time because um, we do want to get those going. But at the same time, it, it feels like that's that's a there's a number of pieces there that you're referencing that would be part of this bigger picture solution. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I do. I think you need track. I think you need the track two stuff that you've identified here and some ability uh, through the energy storage enhancements to uh, you know, allow, allow basically additional bid flexibility within that 135 minute window. Um, and then, then, then I think you could, there's still other issues, you know, um, there's still other issues, you know, about like AS reoptimization, that sort of thing. But you'd have gone, you'll, you'll go a long ways if you actually are able to complete those two initiatives and implement them. Okay, no, that that's helpful feedback, and and we're happy to take that back. And and um, yeah, I, I appreciate the input. Um, so thank you for that. I, I mean, I guess I. I think it would be, and I'll, I want to give the mic back to Sergio um, to keep going through uh, the materials for today. But um, I, I see what you're saying, but it might also be helpful to kind of appreciate, um, you know, the extent to which all you you and other stakeholders can offer. What's the, what are the situations where it is harmful to remove that BCR? And in the way that Sergio is outlining in, in this proposed solution, I appreciate you've put another proposed solution on the table. Um, and again, certainly want to consider that, um, but I'm, uh, but yeah, I, I would just ask for, you know, you know, more feedback on, on where, where, you know, this solution is not just, um, uh, yeah, where, this solution is, yeah, this solution assumes everything's under the control of the scheduling coordinator of the storage resource to reflect real time conditions in their bids. And we're just not there yet. That 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 to me is the issue. Okay, I appreciate that. That's helpful, Don. Thanks, Sergio. I'm I'm uh, I pass it back to you now. Thanks. No, thank you for that, Becky. Um, okay, next up, I think we have Raul, then Chris. And quick sound check, Sergio. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, this is Rahul Kalaskar from AES. Uh, so, I have a few questions on this slide. Uh, can you help me unpack what does this mean that the proposed solution would work in conjunction, conjunction with the AES SOC and all the other constraints? What does it imply? Yeah, it basically implies that the other you know constraints that we have and how they interact with so, uh, BCR will will remain and will continue yeah so if i you know if i construct a simple example assume that the state uh, the soc is at 50% and the end of the hour soc constraints binds in the advisory interval would the resource be eligible for vcr yes the End of our state of charge binds in the advisory intervals, meaning you have that end of our state of charge constraint for the future say, horizon. three hours into the future, right? Not three hours. Let's say you, you RTD, you have uh, 10 intervals. It's binding in the 10th interval, but not in the first one. So when we have the end of our state of charge constraint, there are a number of intervals prior already that are disallowed for VCR. Um, I believe it's the hour and so, some other intervals prior, like more than one hour prior to that, that you VCR is not, like it, the energy is not eligible for VCR. For end of the hour, right? So what about upper and lower yeah. charge limits? Uh, so basically, 
any of these constraints, if they are binding, it's not resource is not eligible for BCR. Any of these constraints, as they are defined today, they will continue to be like to be operational. So, the end of our state of charge constraint, for example, mm -hmm. if you submit that, there are, uh, I, I think it's up to two hours prior that yeah. the energy associated can't be eligible for VCR. So that will continue to be a fact. Uh, okay. Yeah. So in. From from these examples, the only thing is if the SOC is at zero or SOC is at hundred percent, that's the only time. It will yeah, not. Yeah, like in the binding interval. In the binding yeah. interval. And even if the resource is dispatched inconsistent with its bid, I'm trying to figure out the scenario when you have multi-interval optimization, where the resource is either charged or discharged inconsistent with its bid and the soc was either at zero or soc was full i i'll have to construct an example i'll try to put that in my written comments but i'm trying to figure out if that's something you have already discussed so in the case let's imagine that you have a resource that is very near depletion, no? Um, it's almost empty. Yeah. And in the binding interval, it's expected it to seems charge. that prices are going to be way higher than in the advisory intervals. Yeah. So the market would discharge uh, what it can get from that asset. Then in subsequent intervals, uh, you would have the the SOC is now zero, no? Because we just uh, we just depleted that there. Um, if in the next interval um, there was an, a schedule, let's say for five minutes after, and now you're empty, that would would trigger a buyback uh, for that five minute interval, um, but now you're empty. So now in that example, the proposed solution would would kick in. Um, now this is kind of very much like a, it's very constructed like as an example, no, because it would be uh, quite odd that from a five minute interval to the next, we saw like there was going to be a fall in the in the LMP, and instead there's actually a, a massive rise, maybe because of a market condition or you know a line is down, something tripped. Um, but in general, what is more consistent with how resources might operate is that you can get some in a five minute interval, but not depleted until they're they're definitely like fully in the money, uh, the whole remaining SOC. Uh, and then later on, once the SOC is depleted, this proposed solution would be triggered. So, yeah, I mean, this only is triggering, is looking at that binding interval. Um, and and that's when it would either insert a re-rate or de-rate if you're full or empty. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Raul. I think we have Chris and then Michelle. Alba wanted to follow up specifically on Don's comments. Oh, no, we, we can do that. Thanks, Sergio. This is just quick. Uh, I, I think it would be helpful for Kaiso making its case, and I, this is directed both to you and to Becky, that perhaps providing an example of how you think this might be feasible without making the ch kinds of changes Don was suggesting. What, what sort of bidding process do you think is possible for batteries in the current market timeline that would allow them to uh, you know, adjust to varying levels of risk that they're seeing in terms of hitting the state of charge constraint? I'm sort of on, the, on Don's side in that I find it hard to 
imagine being able to really um, hedge adequately uh, against things that we're seeing coming up in the next couple of hours. However, I'm willing to be convinced if, if perhaps you can provide some examples of how you think batteries can adequately protect themselves uh, through their bidding against um, against these kinds of uh, situations. So I just wanted to ask that perhaps you look at, at, at uh, seeing it from the perspective of the battery and, and, and explaining why you think it is feasible in the current market structure to bid in such a way as to uh, uh, protect yourself, it, with, assuming that BCR is disallowed for, uh, for real-time buybacks. Thank you. Thanks, Alva. That's a good um, good proposal for an example. So we can we can do that. Um, Appreciate it. So then let's go to Chris. Yep. Hey there. Uh, this is Chris Devin with Terragen. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks, Sergio. So. Um, the first part, I guess, I want to kind of understand maybe this aspect related to the mitigation. I think we had back on like slide nine when you're talking about, you know, the only uh, part of this where you um, are underscoring some circumstance where there might be a real time BCR warranted. Um, and just kind of try to understand or clarify what the intent is um, from the CAISO side because it's not in the proposal or the issue paper. Um, very clearly. So, um, are you thinking that you would just adjust the proposal uh, potentially after you do some of this analysis to, to see how often uh, mitigation is causing this this outcome? Uh, well, we'll first do some some analysis to see the prevalence of this issue, and if it is prevalent enough, uh, we might. Think about a means to enhance our proposed solution to consider that. Okay. So, no proposal yet, but potentially depending on the magnitude of the impact. And do you think that the, the DEB discussion uh, would help mitigate this concern about over mitigation or mitigation causing this forced buyback? So, outcome? yeah, I mean, I would. Um, I would say that the concern around mitigation could be mitigated with better steps, which would be part of track two of this initiative, and we think that that gets to to that issue. Um, at, the, at the same time, we want to look at the data to see how prevalent um, it would be that it is today that mitigation is associated with buy or sell vex. Um, if we find that you know it's not uh, as as material, given the the number of you know how often this buy and sell vex are triggered, um, maybe we continue to to think that this can be addressed in track two through enhancements to the bid itself. If we find that it is more prevalent than we initially thought. Uh, we could consider, you know, enhancing the proposal to take that into account. Um, but now I think uh, I, the thinking so far, which has been, you know, without the finalization of that data analysis that I mentioned at the beginning of the call, is that we could address these concerns through enhancing the dev as part of track two of this initiative. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate the the color. Um, you know, I think we we would just encourage you guys to look at, you know, not only just across the system and the the amount of times or you know frequency that you're seeing this this impact occurring, but also take a look at individual units that are frequently mitigated and see how often that occurs. Because I think there's instances where some are more more often mitigated, you know, above the average. Um, and they get start getting into the realm of the frequently mitigated unit type of stuff that is, you know, a, a bit of a concern. I think where where this could have an outsized impact on some units if we just wait. Um, which kind of leads me to my next point, which is 
to agree with, you know, I think CISA, some of the PG&E points here, and just our view that, you know, this this is a pretty aggressive schedule. I think we would prefer that PESO slow down um, and think hard about uh, the, the impacts here, uh, particularly on the mitigation piece. It seemed like the MSC was um, in agreement that that was one issue where there, there is some warranted BCR. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think one of the other things I wanted to comment on just in general on these slides and the discussion was, I think when you're talking about these analogies about a thermal resource being on outage, not receiving BCR, it, to me, that doesn't really feel like the proper analogy because it would really be more like a storage unit being on an outage and perhaps a thermal unit being, um, inaccessible because of like the configurations in the MSG or something like that would be more of a, uh, akin to the SOC being constrained in the in the market. So, you know, I, I, I hear what you guys are trying to do to try to you know, explain the, the situation, but I take issue with some of the way that it's been described. Um, and then, you know, as far as the actual binding interval proposal goes, I think that goes to the point that, you know, CISA was making about how storage owners, we, we don't have the proper tools to always reflect that. You know, I think that the MSC and others were saying, well, the offers are what, you know, triggers these binding, um, you know, SOC uh, limitations on these units, but it's also a combination of that and the other advisory interval, you know, outcomes like what I think Rahul was getting at a little bit too. So, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here. And I certainly respect that Kaiser is putting a lot of things in place to try to reflect those constraints and the, you know, kind of use limitation nature of storage and, you know, through bidding parameters and, and market constraints and all those things. But it seems like we're trying to solve an issue on BCR that is a little bit of an, an outsized reaction to um, the, the complexity here. And it might, it might be better if we slow down, talk about it more and not do such aggressive timeline. Um, you know, and, and allow for us to talk about it, it, some of these things that really maybe should be eligible for some kind of uplift. Maybe it's not BCR, but but something. Um, and I, I think we're just, you know, we're, we're seeing how there's there's not a lot of participation from most of the stakeholders on on some of these discussions because it's really complicated. So you know, just just some other thoughts to maybe slow down a little bit and talk about these ideas from CISA and you know um, other stakeholders a little bit more. And, and I just think, uh, you know, if we're going to rush through this so fast, it really should be something that's more of an interim proposal that has some kind of a sun, sunset on it or, you know, a uh, commitment to actually uh, having the, the full discussion um, and, and, you know, maybe working on track two uh, will solve some of those things on the mitigation side. But I don't think that alone solves some of these other issues about actually reflecting the real time conditions and bids and some of this stuff is not actually just the fault of the, the bid and the SC from the unit. So um, I think I'll stop it there on my soapbox and, and let you react. But uh, if you have any questions on any of that, those are just some thoughts. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, I would just say that it would be very useful to understand your perspective as to why there is a material difference between the examples we've we've shared in, in the case of like a conventional asset and storage when they are unavailable due to physical limitations. Um, if you could include that in your written comments, that would be helpful because uh, I think that that inconsistency or differentiated treatment is is important to the conversation. And second, you know, um, we've heard from several stakeholders today that uh, this is fast, that more time might be needed um, to the degree that if you have an idea as to how that would look, that would be useful for us to consider. But also, you know, I'd invite stakeholders that are of that opinion to share a little bit to where more time should be spent. Uh, you know, we, we heard initially that examples are needed and we produced those examples. We heard also that uh, different contexts or concerns uh, could merit or not BCR, and we're given we're given thought to that as well in the case of mitigation, for example. Uh, what are the other areas that would be 
interesting and important for us to consider and weigh whether a delay or modification to the schedule is pertinent. But thank you, Chris. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think next up we have Michelle and then Callie. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from the Energy Division. I, I think I have a slightly different perspective than some of the folks here. I, I would note that, you know, we have spent billions of dollars on the storage assets and their four hour storage assets and they're primarily for resource adequacy. And we know that the resource adequacy is needed during the net peak period. Um, I would note that Kaiso moved forward with order 831 because they wanted to give bidding flexibility precisely to the generators and we moved through that in a matter of two weeks, even though we knew it was not perfect and had many drawbacks, including allowing people to bid at 2000 or the maximum import bid price, even during the net peak hours. Should we have taken the time to do it right? I mean, I, I actually, uh, anyway, um, but we didn't, we moved forward. And the reason we moved forward is because primarily we thought this was a reliability issue, right? That the storage assets in Kaiso wanted the resources to have the ability to hold their state of charge because it was a reliability issue. So I see this as a similar reliability issue. You want storage assets to have every incentive to be there during the reliability times, which are the net peak periods. And I would note that in this instance, that means not having the BCR because you don't have the incentives. And so if we're all about market incentives, it seems, seems to me that the market incentives really have to provide the incentives to be there during the net peak period, which I don't think it takes, I think it's just pretty obvious looking at how um, the demand curve and the, the fall off of the solar assets. I think we clearly know what time we need the solar assets and we should do everything we can to incent them to be there during those times. Um, I think that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your perspective. Um, Kelly. Yeah, hi, it's Kelly Wells with WPTF. Um, I won't take up much time because I think between Don, Chris, and Alva, they hit on all the points um, I was going to make. Um, but just one thing to add is I do think, in addition to the mitigation, I think there's some other conditions that can kind of fall into that bucket of you know, there's market design elements that might cause these resources to have a binding SOC that isn't really the fault of the SC. Um, you know, the real time horizon doesn't see out the, through the full net peak load. And even with the added um, ability to bid above a thousand, just because that hasn't been completely, you know, developed yet for that long term durable solution, which I'm happy to see maybe we'll talk about in track two. Um, you can still have the market design causing this issue um, and as well as advisory prices. We know that the advisory prices don't necessarily always materialize, but they have a direct impact on how that resource is being used um, and how their binding schedules end up. So I think we do need to have a conversation, a longer conversation about what kind of falls into that category and which scenarios or situations do warrant BCR and which ones don't. Um, but I think that's what's missing from this conversation is um, having that robust that robust discussion, and then um, just a couple quick points is you know the MSC did you know throw out a couple different alternate proposals or alternate solutions to consider. I think we owe it to ourselves to talk through different um, ways to address the issue. Um, and I agree with Don. I think there is kind of two different magnitudes of urgency here, and I'm talking more about the I guess what he called the track two urgency issue. Um, and to think about a more holistic approach, um, look at different design options because they do have different incentives and they do have different market impacts. Um, and one of the drawbacks I see of, of this proposal is this does create an incentive that we haven't really discussed. And I do wonder to what extent this proposal is going to incent resources to now bid in a way to ensure that they meet their day ahead schedules, which we all know real time conditions change from day ahead. So if they're bidding in a way that basically self schedules them at their day ahead schedule, we've now lost all that flexibility that these resources are bringing to the market. And that can cause reliability issues. If they're not bidding in a way to be available to meet real time conditions, um, that can also cause reliability issue. So 
that's all I wanted to say. Again, I kind of echo Don, Chris, Alba, you know, point that I think we need to slow down at least on that second magnitude of urgency issue and really take the time um, to think through this and consider alternate proposals as well. Thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, I would, you know, on the topic of uh, the other situations that might warrant BCR, um, you know, we're, we're looking actively at mitigation after that conversation with the MSC and we encourage stakeholders to provide their thoughts and examples through their written comments to continue to have this conversation. So, thank you. Yeah, and I hope we do get to have to continue to have this conversation just at a slower pace so we don't feel like we're drinking from a fire hose and end up with a design in place that has all these unintended consequences and don't really address the root cause. Very well, thanks. So next up we have Josh and then Grant. Yes, good afternoon, Josh Arnold, CES. Uh, I'm going to, in many cases, just echo Callie, because uh, I think most of the points have been made. Uh, I really want to thank Alva, Don, Chris, and Callie for bringing some, I think, really important details and considerations to the discussion. I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the two things I think are most critical, at least in my mind, uh, short term in regards to this. Uh, the first is bid mitigation, especially on the charging bids, because uh, that can easily prevent a unit that otherwise would have charged to be able to meet SOC constraints from being unable to do so. Um, it makes no sense to me whatsoever that a unit that's willing to pay uh, a certain amount of money to act as a load has its bid reduced so that they're saying they'll pay less in the market. That just makes no sense to me uh, because it's, it seems counterproductive to the, the unit's desire to charge up. Uh, the other thing, uh, going back to both Don and Callie, is that you know we do only we do have this 135 minute window where we cannot adjust our bids as storage as any unit, um, and because storage is so SOC constrained, if there's a significant change in the real time conditions, uh, we're in the summer and let's say there's a fire that suddenly drops one of the major transmission lines, the storage units can't can't adjust to that, so they may be taken in and in, you know, let's call it an, an, a, an hour they weren't really intending to. Because hopefully they are bidding as flexible ramping resources using economic bids. Uh, again, as Callie pointed out, so they're not locking into day ahead schedules. They may be taken early to deal with the initial impact of that that transmission problem. Well, if the later hours um, also had high prices, there's an opportunity cost as well. And we've already established that the opportunity costs for these storage units are a valid cost. Uh, that's the entire purpose of the 831 changes that were recently introduced. So I think this is a very complicated issue with a lot of moving parts. And I do appreciate that there could be a significant amount of economic burden that's being introduced into the market because of this. But I really do agree that we should slow down and really consider all of the, the gears and belts and levers and pulleys that, are, that make up BCR. It's an incredibly complicated system. And I think in some cases it's being oversimplified. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Josh. Uh, just as a quick reaction to your comments, you know, I would note that if that were the case, uh, a circumstance like the one you've described, that there, for some reason, is a very significant spike in real-time prices uh, because of a real-time contingency, and that leads to storage being uh, dispatched earlier, under that circumstance, it would be compensated at that new high LMP. Uh, the concern here is not only that it would be compensated under that, it's, it's that today it would get that, but also on top of that, it would get BCR, and it could adjust its bids within that gap of uh, the 100 and so minutes to be able to even get even more BCR, right? So, so in that circumstance of there's a spike in prices, storage resources can respond because they're flexible and responsive and, and they can discharge prematurely, uh, give 
prematurely relative to their head schedules. Um, that's not necessarily, you know, a, a negative outcome. The negative outcome is that that happens, and on top of that, we have BCR, right? Mm -hmm. If that were to happen, they would be compensated at that LMP, and we would have gotten uh, reliability from them, you know, and maybe later, you know, uh, it, it doesn't mean that it will exhaust every single megawatt of state of charge, right? Um, so that is something to consider that our, our concern is not only when discharge happens relative to the day ahead schedule, is that on top of that, there is also not an incentive to, to reflect conditions on the bids and that there might be incremental revenue on top of it. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Yeah, if I can respond to that, Sergio, because I think there's an assumption here that you've stated multiple times that participants would reset their bids to try to recover more BCR. Well, that's obviously... No, it's that they could. It's that they, they could. could. I'm but, not... Yeah. What I'm going to say is, if they were to do so, that would one would be evident to DMM, who could then perhaps begin investigations into that, that participant to see if their acts were malicious and against market requirements. But I'm going to bring up the example again of the 135-minute window. Let's say you get brought on early. You have one hour left of, of discharge, all right? You don't have all, all, all your SOC. You have one hour left. For one hour, you weren't, for one period of time, you weren't going to discharge. Suddenly, you do, okay? Suddenly, you're brought on early within the period of time that you can't rebid. You get brought on to meet the initial constraint that has occurred. Because you have this market activity, because you have the batteries responding, that lowers the system impact on the LMPs. Because now, say you don't have a power balance violation, that keeps the prices low at an appropriate level. At the end of that interval, once the batteries start losing their SOC and can no longer respond, and this would be in both the FMM and the RTD, because we're within that 135 minute window, the batteries come off because they no longer have SOC, the RTD cannot dispatch them, and the prices shoot up higher. Well, now you have now you have a lost opportunity cost because the battery was were leaned on early. Yeah, but this is exactly the type of condition that the changes relative to eight thirty one could address too. Uh, in your well, initial example, in the initial interval, the the, the battery could have bid higher. That like you just have no incentive to consider not that. But Sergio, not necessarily. If the um, if but it's the not four, whether they if the four is or not, it's that they can bid. No, uh, like well, but remember, however they bid, it's up to 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 them. But if they have the ability to bid higher, that we're, we can provide the tools, and they have the ability to 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 reflect that. But Sergio, you're assuming that the prices will go above a thousand dollars. Let's see. In the no, I'm assuming those, that uh, you want to preserve your state of charge until later. When it's when the prices are higher, you well, can use your bids to signal economic availability, economic willingness or not. You know? so, so if this yeah. asset really wants to keep that hour until later, it has the ability to do so. Now, no one, not even the ISO, no one, no one can know if there's going to be a massive contingency in four intervals because of a fire. You know, like that mm -hmm. is. Uh, I don't think that that is material to this example. What is material is could the asset in its initial state operate and bid in a way that preserves state of charge to the hours that that asset, according to their own, you know, economic willingness and their own know-how, they think that they will be able to generate the most revenue. If they can do so, they, then that, that exactly get, moves us towards either well, then there was a, a, a big contingency prices spiked and they made that revenue just before, or they were able to, through their bids, be able to be compensated at the higher price later on. I, so I just don't- Sergio, yeah. again, I'm going to come back to that 135 minute window in which nothing can be changed. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that. One, there is no guarantee that within those windows, eight, FERC Order 831 conditions have triggered, okay? 
if the day ahead has not cleared above FERC 831 conditions and the import bids, the four import the highest import bids are, are at or below $1,000, then no, the battery units cannot bid above $1,000. They will be mitigated through cyber to the soft bid cap of $1,000. That could then, be mitigated through cyber. No, yeah. no, no. If, if FERC 831 uh, if they conditions... If they bid above $1,000, they would be, yeah. Right. yeah. If they're dead... And the FERC 831 conditions do not warrant it. They will not be bid, uh, mitigated to above a thousand. That's that's the rule. They're dead. Let's say their dead comes in at a thousand. FERC 831 hasn't go in. Doesn't matter what they bid. It comes down to a thousand if they're above that. But let's say it's a regular day. Let's say they've bid in at 750 for both hours. Because remember, we have 135 minutes that we can't touch. Let's say the price in the first hour suddenly spikes up to $800, okay? They're economic, great. They get four intervals at eight, four 15 minute intervals, four FMM intervals at 800. Then the last two intervals of the second hour, because again, we cannot adjust bids, spike to a thousand. They now have a $200 opportunity cost because they were taken early to provide that reliability. I'm just saying that BCR is incredibly complicated. And I do agree with all the other participants that we need time to walk through the examples without a lot of these coulds and guesses. There are a lot of assumptions I've heard, you know, even within the, the DMM's paper, there are assumptions. So I, I really would encourage you guys to, to really consider this very carefully. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I think from the last part of your comment, what you are really underscoring is that 135 minute gap. Yes. Uh, the, yes that is because... that is the quid of the challenge as you see it, right? Well, there there is that is one of the big big challenges. That 135 minute gap and the res the reliability response to sudden changes, because that's where we do want resources to not worry about the money. They need to worry about response. We know this. If they don't respond, let's say they think, oh, if I underperform, I'll have a little state of charge, as uh, I can't remember if it was Alva or Don brought up. If I routinely underperform when the prices start going high to stay safe state of, state of charge and ja jack up the LMPs and future intervals, we don't want that. We want the unit to respond to the instruction that they have been given by ADS or the CAISO operators. That's a critical requirement for reliability. And I agree that batteries have this difference. They cannot just keep going interval after interval like a, a natural gas resource can, a conventional resource can do. The problem, the biggest problem I see is that the market and BCR have been set up for the conventional resources. And that made sense under MRTU because conventional resources were the overwhelming near 100% makeup of the fleet. But now we're shifting to this new concept of VERS and storage. So I think we really need to consider the whole thing very, very carefully. That's all I'm saying on this one. Be it the bid mitigation for charging, the 135 minute impact, the evaluation of opportunity costs within situations beyond the SE's control, there are issues here that need to be considered carefully. That's all I'm saying. Hey, thank you for that perspective, Josh. Uh, we appreciate it. And it would be great to, to see it in your comments too. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think we have Grant and then Kathleen. Yeah, thank you, Sergio. This is Grant McDaniel with Wellhead. Uh, I just want to kind of circle back on uh, the, uh, you know, the CAISO taking a look at how often uh, did mitigation cause, um, you know, the, the BCR uh, to bind here. And I just want to say two things on that uh, is to reemphasize that there is a subgroup here, a minority, but a subgroup of uh, storage resources that are local areas that are going to get mitigated at a much higher rate. 
And just because they did not, in, in, you know, wind up getting BCR for a mitigation doesn't mean that they're the possibility that they would have, um, you know, we should look at what the, what the probability that they would have, how often are they being mitigated? Because they didn't get BCR on any day because they were mitigated. It's only because the economics of that day didn't work out that way. But it, you're, it's, it is the, a, that subgroup of, of resources should not be disadvantaged against the rest of the fleet because, you know, when you have those days that could really tank you underwater, we should be, you know, we should be eligible for uh, BCR. Okay, uh, it's just the right thing to do, and so um, I would I would encourage you not just to look at it as a system level or just how often did did they actually get BCR because of mitigation, but how often are how frequently are they getting mitigated? Period that could potentially lead to this, right? And, and again, don't please don't you know set aside a subset of storage resources that become disadvantaged because of this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Graham. We can definitely, you know, keep that top of mind as as we're doing this analysis. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, Kathleen? Hey, Sergio, it's Kathleen Colbert from Bistro. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to listen to the presentation and all the comments from my stakeholder community. I it would be a very long list of names if I were to say, I agree, I agree, great, 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 great points all around. Um, so I'll just say that I, you know, in sum, everyone that I've heard speak has shared a perspective on this problem statement as, and your proposal and the challenges that that proposal may shift onto the storage fleet. And so I think that is how I would encourage you to take back and take a step back and really think about the additional risks on the fleet that this proposal would impose. I will be honest, Sergio, it's pretty clear to me that the proposal as it's been written and as you've talked through today is, is set in stone pretty much and that the input may or may, like I appreciate that you will consider it, but I do not think there's a high probability that you will address these concerns in advance of a final proposal to be taken to the upcoming September board. I might be pleasantly surprised, but that's the tone and kind of the posture that I'm, I'm hearing today. With that in mind, I'm pivoting myself to, if this is implemented, shifting significant cost risk onto the storage fleet, what kind of impact that will have? And I think it's important to land on this and to make sure everyone is aware, especially at the CAISO, that the proposals that you put forward, and if you increase the cost risk on this segment of our fleet that is growing in size because of the long-term resource planning choices that have been made based on long-term resource planning studies that identify that this is a, a strong economic solution, um, those studies and the cost associated with new builds does incorporate projections of how the energy and ancillary service markets will function. So when you remove risk mitigation tools or make them more limited, or you increase the cost exposure on resources, you actually undermine the assumptions that were made in forward planning. You also undermine the assumptions that developers make when they offer projects into those solicitations. And so part of why this is, you know, raises so many emotions is because of the impact of this type of proposal to increase significantly the cost risk on this segment of the fleet, even when it's warranted. And really that's where I've been pushing you from a technical perspective to focus. But today I just wanted to take a step back and say the primary concerns are, this is gonna have an impact on storage long-term. As we get farther into our, our operations, we have to decide what is the economic value of continuing to augment these projects and the economics of this market and the risk mitigation, which is really what BCR is, is mitigating the risk that the CAISO market will result in a suboptimal dispatch and then make us hold to it. When you remove that risk mitigation, 
from our ability to manage our assets, you, you increase risk, which makes it more difficult to argue that long-term continuing operations and maintenance is, is the right economic choice. So we always want to be mindful of efficient market outcomes, providing the right risk mitigation tools, and not taking them away too rashly, such that it could trigger adverse impacts that fall all the way back into forward planning assessment. The last thing I want to leave you with, I just ask you to think about this, is we also want to be mindful to not be unduly discriminatory. Storage is not the only energy use limited resource. Hydro is energy use limited, and they can submit constraints. Daily energy, minimum energy, and maximum energy limits that, that manage their state of charge equivalent. We have participating demand response resources that are also extremely limited during those days. It's, it's important that you make sure that what you're proposing does not disadvantage storage relative to these other assets in a way that is unduly discriminatory. And at this point, I haven't heard you, I've been asking you to go through an overview of these other resource types if they're receiving BCR and what those rules are that apply to them so that we can strive towards consistency. And I haven't seen that yet. So I think that will be your next really important step. And um, thank you for considering my comment. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, so I would have, so a couple of reactions. Let me start at the end. Uh, we are looking into uh, how this works out with other resources. And uh, I think I uh, probably accidentally omitted that from the ongoing work uh, slides because that's part of what we're doing. And, you know, this request of yours of last week, we're integrating it to our, um, upcoming revisions of the paper. So that's one. Uh, second point is that um, we understand storage is becoming an even uh, bigger and bigger, you know, share of our toolkit. And it is precisely because of that, that these kinds of concerns are uh, quite urgent for us to address. Um, in general, you know, I would agree that BCR is kind of a risk mitigation tool as well. Uh, the concern that we have been trying to share and that I believe that, um, you know, we've put out, uh, you know, important information and examples there to, to back up that concern is that right now it's serving in a way that it, that it isolates uh, type of resource from risk rather than mitigate that risk, uh, than only mitigating that risk. Um, that's really why we're framing this as unwarranted BCR. We're not, we're not saying that every single instance of BCR is unwarranted. We're saying that there are instances that are unwarranted because they isolate this resource class from real-time exposure, uh, exposure of real-time prices, meaning that, you know, they're uh, the risk floor is, is different than that of other resources. So, you know, we, we are, uh, when we see that storage will continue to play a key role in the reliability of the system, is that is a key driver as to why we want to address these issues in a timely manner, because in the last, you know, five years, we've seen uh, a 20 fold increase in in, in these resources and that will continue. So we don't want that burden on the market. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, well, the, the, the people paying for the infrastructure to continue to grow uh, without us trying to, to minimize that unwarranted uh, BCR. Um, and, you know, as to whether the market participants you know, they'll look at this and this will inform their future decisions to continue augmenting plants. Um, I appreciate the perspective and, you know, um, we think that, you know, this is part of also 
tweaking, perfecting participation rules, continuously improving, uh, not so much as to uh, eliminating any kind of risk guardrail, but ensuring that it is fair and that, you know, it's not just fully isolating these assets from any risk as we're seeing today works out. But thank you for the perspective, Kathleen. I don't see any other hands up at this time. I'll give folks a minute uh, before we go to the next topics to see if anyone else has final question or comments here. Okay, seeing none, let's go on to talk a bit about the track two issues. And um, after this three, four slides, uh, I'll pause again to see if there's any questions or comments or reactions to the issues scoped within track two. Okay, so the first issue has to do with uh, VCR for energy storage in co-located configurations. Um, just as we've noted with regards to energy storage, um, VCR obviously predates the existence of co-located configurations. Under a co-located arrangement, uh, different assets, usually a storage assets and a, a VER, are located behind a single point of interconnection. Um, these uh, assets are you know, sharing this point of interconnection, but in order to flexibly maximize that utilization, um, many of these resources use what is called the aggregate capability constraint or ACC. Uh, on top of this ACC, uh, there could also be, well, not on top, let's say in addition so that it we can keep the visual of underneath the ACC that are sub ACCs. Um, those might be used if the co-located resource has multiple off takers or multiple uh, scheduling coordinators. Uh, so that way we may have, let's say, a point of interconnection where physically there's a solar asset and a storage asset, but there might be uh, different SCs for different fractions or shares of these resources as well. Um, in addition to ATCs and sub-ATCs, um, we also have another form of uh, an, another indicator uh, uh, that can work with co-located resources that we call the off-grid charging indicator or OGCI. Uh, this was developed by the ISO at the request of many stakeholders that wanted to restrict their charging to the on-site, the, the co-located VER, as opposed to withdrawing energy from the grid. So um, the ISO, we've identified different instances in which the current construct uh, doesn't really recognize uh, properly the interactions between these constraints, particularly as it relates to VCR for the storage assets. Um, similar to the issue that we are uh, currently pursuing under track one, this is a sensitive issue. Uh, it has, you know, the potential for uh, adverse financial impact to the market as a whole. And because of that, uh, we'll provide more detailed information on, on this matter as we have uh, commenced work on track two. Um, but, you know, overall, I would say that the, 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 the idea to leave you with is really that currently uh, the VCR provisions uh, for storage in a co-located configuration uh, does not fully consider the interaction and imp the implications of this constraints, the ACC, sub-ACC, and OGCI. Um, so we'll discuss this in more detail as part of track two. 
the second topic within track two, uh, I think is, you know, familiar to most here. Um, uh, we have developed a uh, storage default energy bit construct as part of SDER4. Uh, some years back, uh, this um, DB, this dev framework enjoyed, you know, support from stakeholders. But recently, we've seen that there's uh, been some advocacy for revising it, for enhancing how the dev uh, for storage works particularly in the context of the PFE initiative, um, the ISO noted that uh, even with an uncapped dev, uh, the opportunity cost uh, factor uh, used to calculate that storage dev um, may not be a sufficient proxy for real-time opportunity costs in days that uh, real-time conditions differ significantly from what was assumed in the day ahead market run. So um, we, you know, have committed to monitor uh, the effects of the of the big cap that is applicable to storage, and uh, consider changes to the formulation of the storage tab so that it can more accurately estimate intraday opportunity costs. Um, and as such, this would be kind of the focus of um, of this topic within the present initiative to look at uh, if there are other proxies that might be uh, better to estimate opportunity costs within the storage tab uh, and how generally to formulate that uh, moving forward. And finally, uh, we have the dev for hybrid resources. This was also part of the conversation in PFE uh, where some stakeholders argued that the flexibility that was now being uh, developed for storage assets should be extended to hybrid resources so that this could preserve their position in the supply stack. Um, in the, at the time of the development of that PFE um, policy or, or modifications, um, we noted that it would not be possible to just easily extend this to hybrid resources since the changes, the modifications that we were doing for storage resources were predicated on the existence and use of the storage dev. Uh, to date, hybrid resources, they do not have a dev and uh, a dev of their own, a bespoke dev. And this is because, you know, they experience, they face different costs than those reflected in the storage tab. Um, so in this context, we want to leverage this initiative to develop a, a dev, a bespoke dev for hybrid assets so that um, we can, you know, uh, continue uh, the development of those uh, modifications uh, for, for this asset class as well. So I think, yeah, I think this is really the end of the, the materials we had uh, relative to to track two and, and overall, the only thing left is next steps. So I'll pause here to see if there's any questions or comments on track two or, or in general, um, as we can move on to the, to more open discussion and uh, following that, um, whoever gets you know on the line uh, after that, we can we can talk about next steps and, and close it out. Uh, right now, I only see one hand from Callie. Hi, it's Callie Russell with WPTF. Um, just two quick questions. One on the track two. So when you mentioned the storage deb. Um, I just wanted to make sure within scope of that is also looking at making changes in both the day ahead and the real-time market, because it was originally proposed to be in the day ahead as well, but the Kaiser pulled that at the last minute. The changes to the debt in real-time or, oh, sorry, it, it, do you refer to the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's okay. So the the latest change that went into place effective, I think, August 1st, for the storage resources was only made changes in their ability to bid above a thousand in the real-time market. 
Um, mm -hmm. Originally, the proposal included that flexibility in both the day ahead and real time, but day ahead was pulled from the proposal at the last minute. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys are still planning on having that conversation of making the changes concurrently in both the day ahead and real time when you're talking about this part of track two, oh, not I just understand. focusing on real time changes. I understand uh, that discussion on bidding flexibility is not part of the scope. This is just looking at the storage data and enhancements to it. Uh, it is oh. discussion on bidding flexibility is part of PFE. Okay, I I assumed that this. I appreciate that clarification. I assumed that this piece of track two was continuing the Kaiso's commitment after the recent FERC order, uh, the bidding above soft offer cap proposal that just went to put into place that the Kaiso was going to talk about enhancing the storage deb so that they can then more accurately reflect costs when they raise or increase above a thousand in both the day ahead in the real time market. So is that not what this effort is looking at and that will be talked about somewhere else or is that what this is addressing? This is about the opportunity cost factor within the storage dev. Uh, but I will pass it on to Becky to provide a little bit more clarity here. Thank you. Uh, Becky, if you're speaking, you're, you're muted. Um, I don't I don't think I can hear you yet. You might be double muted or something. Oh sorry, sorry, sir here. My my technology was um being it happens. weird for a second. Um <laughs> hey Kelly, Becky Robinson here with the ISO. So I think great question and, and we've talked about this um some internally as well. I, I think you know, as Sergio said, the the primary focus of discussions around the storage deb. Uh, that we envision being in scope for, you know, this track two here is really about just kind of um, looking at the deb formulation itself, uh, particularly in real time, right? Where you're um, today, it's constructed as looking at the, the fourth highest day ahead hour. You know, I think we've heard um, interest from stakeholders in, in opening up that conversation um, just to kind of have a better deb construct overall, or, or I should say, you know, identify if there are improvements that we can make to how that calculation happens. Um, your point though about, and, and so I, I would say in part, I think that is, if not a direct line to the 831 changes, it, it does have implications for the 831 changes, right? Because if we have better deb formulations um, that folks have more confidence in that the deb captures opportunity cost, then there might be implications on sort of more general structures around bidding flexibility. But I, I don't, you know, I, I think we have to start that conversation and see where we get and see, um, you, you know, what are those improvements? Um, does that look like it changes the landscape or not? Or, or to what degree does it change the landscape? To your point about, um, which I think we've, we've not explicitly included in the scope uh, in any written materials to date on track two, your your question about is that real time bidding flexibility those changes that we uh, just um, got FERC approval for and implemented that those that apply just to real time are those also are we going to talk about day ahead bidding flexibility in the same way or or extending that bit of bidding flexibility to the day ahead market? Um, we've we've um, yeah, I've, I've, we've been reluctant to include that, uh, to explicitly say, yes, let's talk about that in the storage dev conversations here. Um, because I think in large part, because we wanted to sort of focus on the, the basics of the dev formulation, um, first. And again, see where that conversation gets us to. I, I also think that, um, I think the, the best way of. 
well, maybe I'll pause there and say, you know, we're happy to take it back. It, it is on our minds that, you know, to your point, that was a, a that issue, you know, came up at the ISO Board of Governors and Governing Body meeting. The ISO did make a commitment to continue those conversations. We have been talking about where is the best place to do that. Um, I think, you know, if it if if it there's a, a part of me that says, is it natural to include in the storage deb conversations here in track two? There's also, you know, maybe some, uh, you know, maybe some considerations of why it might want to be considered separately. Uh, happy to take feedback on that and, and hear, you know, what stakeholders think would make most sense. Uh, appreciate you raising it. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that that clarification. I guess my initial reaction is I think 100% it actually falls within this effort. And I'm kind of surprised to hear that maybe that wasn't the, the full intent of the scope, um, just given the kinds of previous commitment to the board and stakeholders to continuing to have those conversations. Um, I think it doesn't actually fall within the storage step, right? Because the main gap was storage resources can't go through the reference level adjustment process to get their costs reflected in the market when they go above a thousand dollars in both the day ahead and the real time. So I'll leave it at that. I again really encourage the crisis to go back and think about that this really is the natural place and this really should be where that conversation is happening, especially given the conversation we just had on the prior topic and how related those are. And if you can get the storage dev and the storage bidding flexibility so that they can actually reflect all their costs in the market, the sooner you do that, the sooner and the more efficient market outcomes and BCR issues, that'll be addressed naturally through that. So um, I appreciate the clarification. Um, that's a little surprising to me. And I yeah, strongly encourage you guys to have that within the scope here. Um, thank you for that. And so do I just had one other quick question. Um, are you guys planning on posting a comment template? Because I know comments are due on Wednesday and I haven't seen a comment template posted yet. So I'm not sure if we should wait for that or just go ahead and, and start submitting the comments without one. Mm, I believe that the template was up. If that is not the case, I'll we'll correct that immediately. Yeah. Okay, thanks. This morning when I checked it wasn't, but maybe it has been posted since we've had this this meeting. So um thank uh, you. It has been posted. It's just under the web meeting that it's under the web meeting of the twenty second. You you can see the link there. Um I'm, I'm seeing it now on the website. It's just not next to the web meeting of today. It's next to the prior web meeting for, for some reason, but, but it is there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I missed that one. I assumed it would be next to this meeting. So thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Let's go, let's go Mike and then Chris. Hey, Sergio, uh, welcome to the Cal ISO. I haven't talked to you since you got the new new gig, so welcome. Uh, Thank you, Mike. Hey, I, I know this isn't necessarily uh, a scope for this call, but um, given that we really haven't heard anything, um, do, do you have anything uh, that you can uh, elaborate on, on what the implementation bug was on the uh, Offer cap changes that happened August 1st and and when we might see a re resolution to that. I mean, I think we lucked out that we haven't seen it triggered. Um, but it's still, but I don't know that it's been fixed and I haven't seen any communications. Um, I, I, for 1, don't have something to to add here. Uh, to be honest, I will see. If is there anyone in the team that might want to to weigh in on this? We may need to follow up on that later. We can circle back. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Becky. We'll we'll follow up with you, Mike, uh, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think it warrants a, a market notice or 
you know, some, something given that it's an active bug in production mm -hmm. that impacts uh, what appears to be your, your charging bids being modified uh, anytime you submit over a thousand dollars, it, you know, it can have, it does, it has had market impacts and, um, you know, anybody that's not been made aware, um, could be being negatively impacted today if, if they happen to try to submit above a thousand. So I think it, it does warrant some more communication. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up on that. Uh, I think next one we have Chris. Again, it's uh, Chris from Terragen. Um, so I did want to mention, I do agree with what uh, Callie was uh, uh, pointing out from WPTF about, about, you know, how this, this process with the discussion that, you know, is tied to the follow up to the soft offer cap proceeding and, you know, some of that discussion, I, I would just also like to, you know, provide our voice that, that also similarly feels that Kaiso has, you know, this seems, this feels to be a, a bit of a knee jerk reaction for, um, initiative overall, uh, you know, following that and yet it's now becoming somewhat scoped limited. So it's a bit of a concern to us. I think it would be more appropriate if Kaiso were to launch into ongoing workshops on, you know, PFE storage related issues or open the scope up on this initiative more appropriately to, to talk about all those things. I think Kaisa did a lot of good, good work and hard work to bring everybody along in that effort, you know, Becky and Sylvie and, and others, you know, really, I think that was a big effort to try to explain everything here um that that happened you know in the background and, and the systems and what the limitations were on the implementation and so i just encourage you you all to think about you know trying to kick something off in concurrence with this or you know shortly thereafter or scope all those things into this um into this effort to try to at least you know even if it's going to be in like the, the track two or phase two or whatever um to, you know to try to talk about this holistically again it kind of just goes back to those earlier earlier points that everybody was making um, you know, on, on storage and how it's in the, in the market, you know, we've been expecting the energy storage enhancements initiative to be kicked off starting Q1 of this year. And so we, we just keep getting delays on being able to talk about stuff holistically. And it just, it's very concerning. It doesn't seem like Kaiso is willing or able to talk about storage, um, in a manner that, that, you know, looks at everything that needs to be discussed, you know, again, holistically. So. So that, that's my soapbox on that one. And then specifically on the hybrid Debs piece, uh, it's again, it's gonna sound like a broken record here, but I gotta say it, it does, you know, it does concern us, I think, to see this being scoped into this initiative. Um, I, I think that one is a really complicated uh, uh, endeavor it, just to talk about the Debs. Uh, but then when you, you know, the, the, what prices would you use for these uh, units and you know, lack of, SOC being used for hybrids um, in the market is, you know, it's mind blowing how how you would even propose to do that. So uh, I'd love to see if Kaiso had some initial suggestions there, but just saying that this is in the scope does does concern us because it really it, it should go along with a more of a comprehensive hybrid initiative where we talk about all of the tools that are available to hybrids and you know why should they be mitigated? Why should they be allowed to? bid over the soft offer cap like standalone or co-located storage and what what tools including dynamic limits should be allowed to be used and how and all, all those things need to be discussed about hybrids that haven't been discussed since 2021 um really at all um or even back to 2020 uh, a lot of the stuff that was done in 2021 was related to the, the accs for co-located units so so you know that that being said i, I just want to say this publicly for everybody you know we we are concerned that Kaiso is not talking about storage and hybrid resources in a very holistic manner and keeps doing piecemeal changes like this. So we would encourage you to rethink the scope and kind of the whole track too, and, you know, try to either hold off on doing the hybrid devs until you can talk about this overarching hybrid 
resource model and all of the issues and limitations with it um, and, and you know, needs for potential improvements. Uh, uh, I think that would be our preference. Um, and you know, we've, we've been a little bit more concerned with track one and the schedule on this, obviously. So I just thought, um, you know, since we're talking about track two and we don't see any real firm proposals yet that we wanted to at least give you guys some verbal feedback that, that we'd like to see that, that kind of either, you know, de-scoped or, um, you know, promises of some other more holistic discussions on hybrids being made as well. Okay. That's all I had for you today. Thanks for your time. Um, so just to clarify, Chris, I think I heard you say that you'd rather us not do, not include hybrid devs as part of this initiative. Yeah, I don't think it's appropriate because we have a ton of other issues with hybrids that have been left um, unclarified or unfinished. So back in the 2020 initiative that was, you know, okay. how do they participate in AS? How do they? How should we be using the uh, dynamic limits or outages for? hybrids and, and, you know, a lot of things that we flagged in our, our prior comments on like the stakeholder initiative catalog. And, um, you know, I think rather than just only creating a hybrid resource dev in this initiative, it would be a lot better idea to talk about hybrid model in general, all of the things that are going into that, including the, the, the tools that, that I was mentioning and, and then say, you know, let's talk about the devs then at that point, I, I just don't see a pressing need for it right now i mean i, I okay. get it that you're, I, I get it that you guys are referencing the whole you know uh idea of needing the the devs to to allow the soft offer cap thing right and we asked for you know that that treatment for hybrids to be able to bid above the soft offer cap and so i recognize why you guys are wanting to do that i i just think it's it's just doing a limited creation of high uh hybrid resource devs in this initiative is gonna maybe be a little bit short-sighted because there's so many complicating factors. So like, I, I think we wanna sure. be able to have the ability to bid above the soft offer cap, like a standalone or a co-located resource on the hybrid side, mm -hmm. but there's there's a lot of complicating factors. So that, that's why I'm trying to just say, maybe maybe think about you know opening up that other initiative. Yeah. Um, it, it, if you guys aren't gonna open up a hybrid initiative, I think, you know, kind of going back to the earlier point that I think Callie was making about trying to talk more about just all of those order 831 issues. Um, you know, I think that maybe it comes in at that point, um, potentially. So it, it, this is just initial, you know, verbal feedback. I think we have to maybe think a little bit harder about all of these interactions, mm -hmm. um, certainly, and, and, you know, want Kaisa to think about that too. So just, just kind of raising that. Yeah. Uh, just, Couple of, of comments based on on your your feedback. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that the scope. Well, the purpose of the issue paper with regards to track two is precisely to get feedback on the scope and the topics and what you guys might be suggesting. My my response to to Cali, I, I, it wasn't for me to say that the scope is limited to this. It was more so that hey, this is what we've been thinking. Uh, we were thinking of the storage tab in this context, but to the degree that you or any stakeholder has feedback on the scope of track two and what is more important, what is less important, what should be added or subtracted from it, um, that's really the point of the issue paper and of the comments. So we welcome all of that and we'll consider it. Um, so I don't want to leave you with the you know, with the perspective or or the conclusion that the scope is fixed. Uh, no, please give us your feedback, and we want to to build that together, right? Uh, that's one. Second, uh, track two uh, relative to 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 track one. You know, uh, we don't think that it will be as as time constrained or uh, that it will be as agile, like as, as expedited as track one. So uh, in that same context, having a more robust conversation or um, an understanding and looking at all, all of the topics in a more interconnected or holistic way, I think is within the realm of feasibility. 
So if you have any feedback on what should be in track two and how we should address it, let us know. Uh, this is not set in stone. This is not quote unquote scope uh, scope limited. Uh, like we you know we want to include topics that are, are reasonable to address together. Uh, reasonable meaning it's kind of the same crowd of stakeholders that want to be engaged. It touches upon issues in a thematic connection, but do let us know because you know this is uh, something that we can you know, take take that feedback into account and make sure that we have a successful process for for track two. Uh, and on your concerns regarding the hybrid dev, uh, it would be really valuable for us to understand through your your comments um, if. You know, it would be better to put off that conversation and have a hybrid other, you know, venue, or if well, those, some of those hybrid topics that you think should precede the discussion of the hybrid dev, uh, maybe more, you know, of a priority than others here. So do give us that feedback because we'll, we'll welcome that. Uh, I just don't want, you, Chris, Callie, or anyone to think that, you know, track two is set in stone already because no, that's that's really the purpose of the issue paper and all of this. With track one, we're moving way quicker, you know, like, but track two, uh, we want to understand your, your perspective and preferences and uh, consider that as well. Um, okay. Very good. Well, yeah, thanks for that, Sergio, and, and I respect that. Uh, response, it's helpful to know, you know, you guys are totally locking down the scope. So yeah, we will, we will certainly provide some of that feedback about, you know, the hybrid devs, yeah. and what we think about, on, you know, what are the other impacts and why we think more holistic discussion on hybrids is needed and that sort of thing, um, you know, and, and how it's related to the, to the soft offer cap uh, discussions and, and, and all of it. So uh, appreciate the feedback there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think the the last hand I see is Kathleen's. Great, thank you. This is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Uh, can you hear me? Sergio, can you hear me? Oh, I said yes, but I was muted. Uh, oh. Yes. Go oh, ahead. okay. Sorry. Uh -huh. Excellent. Uh, so, thank you for the opportunity to make this comment. Um, I want to provide this piece of feedback and it's coming from a place of, of deepest respect for how difficult it is to track stakeholder input over the years. I did want to note that your first bullet is not accurate and, and I'm struggling a bit with it because, you know, Vistra was very vocal in the editor for process and storage deb about our concerns with the limitation of the storage deb, we had more concerns than even the ones that we put into our board letter, but we submitted a board letter identifying those concerns that we had and the fact that we were concerned that it was an inaccurate storage deb and that it was gonna lead to over mitigation. And I'm struggling a bit with how you could arrive to, like how the Kaiso collectively, not you, this isn't you, you just started, but how the Kaiso could collectively like kind of arrive to this view that there is unanimous stakeholder support for the storage stuff that exists today, especially when a letter was submitted to the board. I mean, that's a level of stakeholder engagement that, that takes a lot of internal thought. Um, it, we take it seriously when we submit board letters. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of vetting involved in that. Um, so it, it, that is a big step. It's also highly documented. And I, I thought it was important enough to raise because it's a really important that everyone knows that concerns were raised. Um, we raised concerns about the choice of the fourth highest hour, but what's in our board letter, we, we raised the concerns about the frequently mitigated unit adder not being made available. And I heard Chris talk today about fre frequent mitigation. And as I listened to Chris, I thought to myself, 
that's in that board letter I sent. And then we arrive to this slide that, that inaccurately depicts that there was unanimous support. And so I'd like to ask you to revise it to respect the engagement that this was submitted. And I, and I hope you receive this request with the respect that is being given. Yes, I apologize for the language we can revise it. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Okay. Um, I don't believe I see any other hands at this time. I'll give folks another final moment to see if someone has a question or comment. Very well. Well, seeing none, I'll pass it back to Brenda to take us through the next steps. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, if I can have Yolande pass the presentation right to me really quick, I can go ahead and uh, our presentation next steps. So thanks for everyone for here who are in this call. This call is recorded and it will be posted hopefully by the end of this week. We do have a, upcoming milestones which include the state quarter comments deadline on the 8th. Also the 14th of August we plan to post a draft final proposal and then followed by that meeting on the 19th. Um, we definitely appreciate the valuable comments our stakeholders are planning to submit. So any upcoming notices will be sent out through the ISO's daily briefing. We do have that link that I sent earlier for the initiative webpage. As well, we do, I did prepare a quick um, overview of the timeline of what we're looking at when it comes to the upcoming next steps. So those who would like to kind of visually see how the timeline is, today the 5th, the 8th, we have that comment deadline, and then we do have that posting on the 14th and then followed by that meeting. So um, thanks everyone for just being able to understand the deadline, but this is just a visual for those who are able to see it on a, you know, calendar view. The next is just the energy blog matters. We did have a up, uh, upcoming um, posting on the ISO update 20 year transmission outlook. Um, Neil Miller, our VP, um, has provided some information as well as Danielle Mills, so feel free to check that blog out as it provides a lot of insight towards what we're going for the clean energy. And then lastly, we do have our new policy initiatives um, landing page having a timeline with a snapshot view uh, with the ISO State Quarter Affairs. This will provide a glance of the project levels of the ones that are currently active on the State Quarter Center. And then we do have our stakeholder symposium um, that has opened up. We welcome a lot of those who are able to sign up now and register for the, either the welcome and reception as, as well as the networking reception at the symposium program. We do have a lot of sponsorship opportunities. Um, we are getting a few and that's very exciting. As well for those who wanna um, get more information, just send, send us an email at symposiumreg at kaiso.com. But with that, just a reminder, this presentation, it is, it is posted uh, from this morning and it has an appendix as well to include information from the example. But if any updates are made, we will be sending them out at the daily briefing as well in any um, that webpage that is on the ISO initiative webpage. But other than that, we would thank everyone for participating in today's call. We look forward to your comments as well. If you don't have that link, we do have just sent it out now, but feel free to visit us on that um, webpage and you'll see um, a few meetings related to the energy storage, um, sorry, the storage bid cost recovery and default energy bid enhancements, as well as the MSC um, materials that were posted last week that's also referenced in this um, particular initiative page. We want to make sure if there's any topics brought up in other meetings, they're also being linked towards this page. So feel free to check that date out on that Excel and then we'll be happy to help. But at this time, I'll pass it back to Yolan to end our call. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. 
conference is now over. You may now disconnect. Have a wonderful day.